worship with us this morning. church the Lord be with you and also with you you may be seated during our time of announcements this morning hey preacher did you know what what there is a birthday boy here today there's a birthday boy here today yes and he's a little angel yeah he is a little angel happy birthday to you do we need to sing to you yeah. uh, <laughs> he's going happy birthday <laughs> are you going to lead it Dee? no because he went Oh, let him sing then. So you're giving him the option? No, okay, okay. We're going to do this the old-timey way. And this way is the way we used to do it for the youth group. And we would go, happy birthday to you, Colton! 
Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you, Colton. Happy birthday, dear Colton. Happy birthday to you, Colton. Happy birthday, Colton. <laughs> It's good to see everybody, those worshiping in person and those joining us online today. Thank you for carving out time to make worship a priority in your weekly rhythm. We gather for worship to glorify God and so that the people of God might be sanctified. And we'll turn our attention to those acts of worship here in just a moment. We do have a few announcements. Let's get everybody on the same page moving forward. Uh, mark your calendars for a few things. First of all, uh, next Sunday... It is August 15th. Um, it's printed here July 15th. It should be August 15th. You understand. Uh, August 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Royal Avenue Pool. Uh, we are having a church-wide pool party next Sunday. So come and be a part of that. It'll be outdoors. I think there's talk about ordering pizza. It's just going to be a good time of fellowship. Everybody, come. Sometimes it's just good for the people of God to throw a party, right? In John chapter 2, Jesus went to a wedding in Cana, and it was just a big old party. So it's okay for the people of God to do that. So come and enjoy that, enjoy some fellowship, and let the kids splash around in the pool. Today at 5 o'clock in the gym over at Central School, there is a prayer service, and um, uh, Amanda Davis, our director of youth ministries, and myself have been asked to lead a couple of prayers over there. So this is for the entire community. Cornerstone Church of Christ invited us to be a part of this. So we're coming together. So come and be a part of that as we pray for our students and teachers and government and administration and the whole nine yards. Uh, you have a litany of other announcements in your bulletin. I'll trust you to get to those either with a paper bulletin, which we have as you enter the uh, Family Life Center, or our e-bulletin, and you can use the QR code that's probably going to appear somewhere behind me, or you can go to ph.church and you have a way to get to your e-bulletin there. So this will get you all the announcements that you need to keep us all moving forward in the same direction. One additional announcement, parents, since a lot of you have just come in right before the blessing of the backpacks, um, today, if you would, during the affirmation of faith, after the sermon, when I have the congregation stand for the affirmation, and then we go into our closing song, if you would, go ahead and retreat down to the children's area to retrieve your kids. Miss Jennifer has um, uh, got to go relieve someone at her Aunt Virginia's house today. So if, if you would, please, uh, please go uh, retrieve your kids during the affirmation of faith. We are also beginning a new sermon series today called Grace Is. We're going to be emphasizing grace throughout the rest of the month of August. While we set our attention back to school, also turn your attention back to church. Okay? During this time, new beginnings happen. We get back into the rhythm of life. Make sure you plug church into the rhythm of your life. Invite all those people as you look around this worship space and you see seats that might have been occupied you know, uh, a year or so ago by someone and they're not currently occupied or haven't been over a few months. Be intentional about inviting them back to church. Sometimes we just get out of the rhythm and the routine. Invite them back so that they can come be a part of us. They're going to hear sermon series on grace. I think everyone can could use a sermon series on grace every once in a while, and it would be an inviting sermon for everyone to come back to. I believe that is everything that is pressing uh, Women's There's, Conference August 21st. Yes, the Women's Conference is August 21st. We have 107 that are signed up, and we're going to need some help. Uh, we need some desserts, uh, sheet cakes or pies is what we've asked. We're going to be cutting those up and have them individually placed out, so that will be a lot easier. So if you can make a couple of desserts, please let me know uh, as soon as possible. And also, we're going to need some men, volunteers, for that day to help serve. We don't want the women that are signed up for the conference to have to miss the conference serving lunch. So we would love to have at least five or six of you men that would come and, and work in the kitchen just to fix plates. Um, and that's it. Y'all can listen if you want to, but you know, just don't say nothing because it's a women's conference. <laughs> We're gonna be saying plenty. But anyway, y'all be praying for that and I'd appreciate it. Very good, that's all church.
Let's turn our attention to our acts of service. We're here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me begin our time together by offering everyone gathered here, near, and far this word of good news. God loves you, and so do we. Welcome to worship at Pleasant Hill. If you would, let's pray. Lord, we come to worship with so many things going on in our lives. Some things are wonderful and they cause us to rejoice. Other things cause us fear and trembling and anxiety. Fill us afresh with the gift of your grace today so that we might face the world with unbound hearts, with joy, and lives that are unafraid. In the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, we pray. And together the people of God said, Amen. At this time, I would like to call all students from pre-K age all the way up through college, even if you are 30 or 40 year old going back to college to come forward. Miss Amanda is going to offer a blessing over our students and their backpacks, their folders, their favorite pen, something like that. Just come forward and let Amanda spend some time with you and bless you as we kick off a brand new school year. Wow, this is great. First, I want to, well, unfog my glasses. But um, thank everybody for their donations, their prayers, for everything that they did to send us to youth camp this year. We appreciated it so much, and I think the kids had fun. I know I did. It was a true blessing to us. And I just have a, a short little devotional this morning. Back to school time can be both exciting and scary. We're learning new things, becoming familiar with new ideas. There'll be new students in our classes. We'll have a new teacher. The material will be more challenging than the year before. All this is that God wants us to be full of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 5 through 7 says, Let the wise hear and increasing in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is in the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we should increase what we're learning. We should ask God for more wisdom and more guidance so that we can understand. We should also honor God. Those who honor God have wisdom, but those who do not choose to honor God are fools. We should always desire to learn and to grow in wisdom, but above all of our classes and above all of our studies, we should desire to learn who God is first. So we have a little backpack charm. And there's two little dangles on here. One says faith and one says blessed. So always remember your faith in God and remember that you are blessed. So here's our prayer. Dear God, thank you that we go back to school, that we get to go back to school and to be filled with knowledge and wisdom. We pray that our hearts could always be yours and as we learn at school, let us also learn to study your word. Lord, we also pray for protection and safety as we go back to school in the midst of another COVID spike. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So you all come up and get one of these. You can put it on your backpack.
Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. One thing. It never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. satisfies my soul and I never ever have to be afraid one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me Love never fails and never gives up, and never runs out on me. Your love in life, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My day is paid. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. Your Because of your great love, I see your nails on hands. I see your open arms. You call me just as I am. Cause Jesus, that's who you are. Nothing can separate. Power that overcame the grave. 
covers all I've done. Your mercy has washed away all the lies of who I was. I'm free from the guilt and shame. With all of my chains undone, and I'm standing here today, all because of your great love. And I will never be the same. I'll never have to wear those chains again. The freedom is one because of your love. covers all I've done. Your mercy has washed away all the lies of who I was. I'm free from the guilt and shame with all of my chains undone. And I'm standing here today all because of your great love. Standing here today, all because of your great love. You may be seated. All who are able, please remain standing for our gospel reading this morning from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Hear these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Congregation, you may be seated now during our song of preparation in which we prepare our hearts to receive the preached word. You spoke in worlds were formed You breathed and life was born You knew that Whoops, I'm on the wrong song completely. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, I'll what are we singing? <laughs> you gave, you your, gave life your life away. That's it. it. Okay. Hang on a minute. I'm on the wrong song completely. Hang on. I'm stuck. All right. You spoke and words were formed. You breathed and life was born. You knew that one day you would come. So far from heaven's throne, clothed in human form. You showed the world the Father's love. And you, you gave, gave, you gave, gave your, your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. And your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debts can pay. You gave, you gave your life away for me, for me. You lived a sinless life. Yet you were crucified. You brought our freedom on the cross. Forsaken for our sin, 
you died and rose again Jesus you are the Lamb of God and you gave you gave your life away you gave you gave your life away you gave you gave your life away for me and your grace is broken every chain my sins are gone my debt's been paid you gave, you gave your life away for me, for you me. And you gave, you gave, you gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. And your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me. Forsaken for my sin, you died and rose again. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. And your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me. So first of all, it is great to be back um, preaching for you this morning. You guys have had a two-week break from me now. I hope you hadn't gotten too used to it. Uh, I want to thank Ian Butler. Uh, man, he did a fantastic job here a couple weeks ago. And then last week's homecoming service, I thought was just a powerful worship service all the way around. Chris Montgomery did a fantastic job. I thought the choir and praise band, it was just a great time of worship and I want to say I, I consider myself privileged to be able to call Ian and Chris colleagues in ministry. They are fantastic folks doing fantastic ministry, and I'm grateful they came and shared with us. But I'm glad to be back here with you today. And somewhere along the way in each of our lives, I know you can probably relate, and if you can't, students and youth and young adults, just hang on for the ride. I promise you there's going to be a time in your life when you have to rely on the graciousness of someone else, you're going to have to rely on someone else's gift of grace to you because there's going to become situations in your life that you cannot manufacture or produce an answer for. God gave us the good gift of community, and God gave us grace for just such of those times. One time in my life when I needed a gift, something I could not manufacture, I needed the grace of someone else that had resources I did not, was early on in my ministry. Back in 2007, Melanie and I um, purchased a home in Rainsville, Alabama. We had moved to the Rainsville, Fort Payne area in 2003. Uh, that's the year that we were married. That's where my mom's from. That's where my mom lives now. And so we moved back into that area. And in 2007, we, we bought a house in Rainsville. I was working as a general manager of a, a local steel plant. At the time, we were putting down roots, the whole family thing. It was all, everything was good until I started receiving a call to ministry. Has God ever just stepped in the middle of your life and just messed everything up completely? So it was, we had bought this house, and it was right before the housing crash of 2008. Anybody remember that? Real estate just, I mean, it just tanked. Everything was terrible. But anyway, we bought the house in 07. I answered my call to ministry, and we didn't really know what that would look like. It kind of made sense since I, since I had a musical background to start in, in music ministry. So that's what I did. I became the music minister at Asbury United Methodist Church in Fort Payne, Alabama. I kind of stuck my toe in the water to see how ministry would work, and I did it in an arena that I was comfortable with. 
Well, in 2009, I was then hired full-time as their youth pastor and worship pastor at this same church. And I served there for seven and a half years, almost eight years. And so while I was serving there, we could live in our house. And everything was fine, but I was called into ministry in the United Methodist Church. And in the United Methodist Church, we clergy, when we sign on as elders and we're ordained, we have to commit to something. We commit to what's called the itinerant system. You ever heard of that? The itinerant system means we serve where sent, when sent, by the bishop and a point of cabinet. I, was, I had finished seminary, and I had been commissioned, and I received my first pastoral appointment. It was over an hour away from where we lived in Rainsville. It was in Jacksonville, Alabama. Part of the things that complicated this was it was a little too far to commute at that point in time, but the appointment was a minimum salary United Methodist clergy appointment which meant it was a bit of a pay cut from what I was making at my current church I was serving on staff at. To offset some of the pay gap, they offered me a housing allowance because they didn't have a parsonage. Well, that meant I had to rent a house in a college town plus pay my mortgage back home and support a family of five on the minimum clergy salary. You begin to see the tension that's happening here, right? And you know what kind of conversations happen in the household when time after time after time there's just way too much month at the end of the money? Anybody can relate? Can you relate? All right. So this became a common thing. So I served and about a year into the appointment the financial strain became so overwhelming. We just could not do it anymore. It was literally breaking our back. So I went to my SPRC chair and I said, look, I'm going to have to move back to my home in Rainsville. I'll commute to the church a couple days a week. I'll maintain all the everything, but I'm going to have to commute. I can't afford to pay for two houses and continue to do ministry this way. My SPRC chair said, this church really is not going to be able to handle that. And I said, well, I'm not asking. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. And she said, no, look, we had an associate before who commuted, a beloved associate, and one day during his commute, he was in a car accident and suffered a traumatic brain injury. This congregation is not healthy enough to have another commuting associate pastor. Do you see how I was in the middle of a situation? I could not manufacture an answer for myself. I, when we say that money doesn't grow on trees, I couldn't go plant a money tree in my backyard and all of a sudden make everything okay. I was in the middle of a situation I could not fix. Then I get a phone call. Church member says, Hey, Pastor Andy, can I have a meeting with you? Of course, of course. So we set up a meeting, and this individual and his wife, they choose to remain anonymous, and I will honor their wishes until the day that they're no longer with us and I can speak their name in public and do it with integrity. We sat down at a meeting and he said, you know, my wife and I have just been feeling God's Spirit moving in us. And we just cannot settle ourselves down. We see so much ministry potential in you and your family. We want to free you up to do ministry as God intended. We want to buy your house in Rainsville, and we want to donate it to a local charity so that it helps some, some of the poor in your old neighborhood and frees you guys up to do ministry as God intended. Now, I received that gift, right? I was speechless. This was a gift, not just any gift, folks. It was the exact gift that we needed in order to further our spirituality and our life in ministry. Do you understand that? Not just a gift, the gift. And it was grace. It did not just result in me saying thank you and sending them a card. It resulted in us receiving their gift, blessing others. And then from that day forward, it changed the trajectory of our ministry path and how we approached ministry. No longer were we shackled. No longer were we bound to certain things. No longer was that weight hanging over our heads. We were free to serve God with a whole and healthy 
heart. And part of that path now has brought us here to this appointment. You know, that's the, the, the thing about grace. Sometimes we don't really even realize we're in need of it until we realize we're in need of it. And other times we are in so deep that there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves and it takes an act of grace to move us forward in life. See, despite our circumstance, grace can find us. And grace can make a way. What a gift. We look at our text today. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a leader among the Jews and a Pharisee. Surely somebody that has their life all together, that is serving God as best they can in the way that they know how, surely this person has got everything all together and doesn't stand in need of anything, right? As the conversation goes along, we find out pretty quick that Nicodemus needs something. Nicodemus needs a gift, but not just any gift, church, a specific gift. A gift of grace. A gift that can free him from bondage so that he may serve God fully as God intended. A gift that will produce a life change like none other. And that gift that Nicodemus needs is sitting right across the table from him in the form of Jesus Christ. Now, John 3, 16 and 17 are some of the most well-known verses in all of the Bible. Sometimes we think we know what they say, but I want to make sure we know what we think we know that we know, right? So I want to do something a little bit different this morning. If you've been attending uh, my Wednesday night Bible study, you will see this kind of follows my Wednesday night Bible study pattern. If you like it, I'll see you Wednesday. Um, if not, just know that this is... This is a different way. I don't normally preach this way. I don't normally preach exegetical like this. I tend to be more narrative. But I think this is really important, especially for a text that we think we know so well. I want to break down this text for us just a little bit because just about every word in John 3.16 is important. And it shows us how God offers a gift of grace through Jesus Christ that we cannot get any other way. We cannot manufacture and produce in and of ourselves what God gives us through Jesus Christ. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care who is in office. I do not care about how big your house is. I don't care how dire your situation is. There's nothing you can do to produce what God has already given us in Jesus Christ. You are powerless to do so. Aside from God's gift of grace. So let's break down this, this verse just a little bit. I want to take you through some of these words. The verse goes, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. We start out with God so. And I want to stop right there on the word so. The Greek word there is autos. Really what this means is in this way. So think of it this way. God, comma, in this way, comma, love the world. The emphasis here is not really on how much. I'll be honest with you. Everyone agree with me on this. We are so over wearing masks. And we are so over COVID-19. That is how much we are over this whole situation, right? When we read this and it says God so loved the world, it is not how much. God loved at this point, but how God loved. In this way, God loved by giving God's Son. The exact gift, notice, not just a gift, not just a gift that would result in us saying thank you, God, and sending God a card. The exact gift that the world needs. In this way, God loves by giving us exactly what we need, even before we realize we even need it, right? Nicodemus had no idea he needed Jesus' grace until Jesus stepped onto the scene, did he? Yet there Jesus is meeting him in the midst of his mess and struggle. 
We call that prevenient grace. Grace always begins with God. Hear me, church. If you hear nothing else I say today, hear this. Grace always begins with God. God in this way so loved the world. Cosmos is the word. Now, in all fairness, when you read John's Gospel, a lot of times when you see the term the world, it's referring to those who are in opposition of Jesus and God's message through Jesus. You see that in John chapter 15 uh, when Jesus says, um, you know, if you were of the world, the world would still want you around, but you're not of the world, you're mine, that kind of thing. He's talking about the world as people that stand opposed to the message that he's been sent to deliver. Here, however, the word means something different. It refers to <clears throat> everything, all of creation. And when God spoke creation into being, what did God declare creation to be? Good. Good. God declared creation good. The word here means the good creation. It also means those who stand in opposition to God. And it also means the faithful. Essentially, what we're being told here is that God, in this way, so loved all of creation, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that God gave. Make sense so far? Good. So we're going to stop at the word gave. God, in this way, so loved all of creation, the good and the bad and the ugly, that God gave. The word is ditto me. John 3.16, according to scholar Gail O'Day, John 3.16 is the only place in the fourth gospel that says God gave God's Son. The more common expression is that God sent Jesus, and we see that in John 3.17. But in John 3.16, the gospel writer is very specific to say God gave. To send Jesus is more associated with God's will. We send something with a great level of expectation. But when we give something, it is out of our great love and out of our compassion for somebody else. It not only has to do with God's will, but in this instance, God gave out of God's great love. And this really shouldn't surprise us. We have some words that we like to use to describe God. They, they start with O. Oh, a lot of them we, we tend to throw out there are omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Those are words we like to use to describe God, and those are good and proper. But that's not the divine attribute of God. Do you know what God's divine attribute is? According to the ancient people, chesed, loving kindness of all things that God is God above everything else is loving and kind so it shouldn't surprise us that God in this way loved all of creation the good and the bad and the ugly that God loved so completely that God gave God's best God gave God's self, Jesus Christ. You see, God loves a lot. So much that God in this way completely loved and gave us Jesus, and Jesus is the ultimate gift of God's grace. God in this way so loved all of creation, the good and the bad and the ugly, that in God's great love, God gave God's only son. Now I want to look at the word only there. The Greek there is monogamies. We want to translate it only begotten son. Some of your translations say that and you know don't run home and start scratching out words in your Bible. It's okay if it says that. But where that really comes from is a mistranslation of Jerome's Vulgate when Jerome, a 4th and 5th century a priest and scholar, translated the Bible into Latin. 
and it appeared he wanted to superimpose into John's gospel uh, a doctrine of the virgin birth, because John's gospel doesn't give us that, right? And the, the virgin birth, and the birth of Jesus in John's gospel starts this way. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Jesus is on the scene at that point. Pow, that's it. There's no shepherds, there's no wise guys, there's no stable, there's no nothing. Jesus, the Word, comes onto the scene. <clears throat> While John doesn't emphasize the virgin birth, it's a doctrine that we hold dear, we know that it is there, it seems as though uh, Jerome wanted to put it in there, and that's okay. But that's not really what this term means, because in John's gospel, the ones who are begotten or born are children of God are us. What monogonese really means is unique, one of a kind. The emphasis here is that Jesus is holy, H-O-L-Y, and holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, other, different, the only one of his kind. There is, there's a praise song, I don't know, you guys might sing it, it's a song that says, there is no one like you, there has never been anyone like you. That is exactly what John is saying here. Jesus is the only one of his kind. In John's gospel, to see Jesus is to see God. To hear Jesus is to hear God. Now, as holy and sanctified as some of you folk are out here in the congregation, to see you is to see part of the image of God. To hear you is to hear part of the message of God, but not wholly to see God or the message of God. You understand. Jesus, in that respect, is different for to see him is to see God and hear him is to hear God because Jesus is God. God in this way so loved all of creation the good the bad and the ugly that God out of God's great love gave God's unique one of a kind son who offered a unique one of a kind you cannot manufacture on your own sort of grace. The gift that each of us need that we in and of ourselves cannot provide. This unique gift of grace literally stepped into our neighborhood in the form of Jesus Christ and made his home among us so that despite our mess, God's grace might abound in our lives and in the world. You see, the good news we find here is that despite our circumstance, grace can find us, and grace can make a way. What a gift. Does anyone need grace to make a way this morning? I'm here to tell you, through Jesus Christ, it can. Is there anyone here today, worshiping in person or online, that needs grace to reach down and find you in the midst of your mess? I promise you, grace can find a way, because that's what John, the gospel writer, and the gospel in a verse is telling us right now, that despite our circumstance, the grace of God through Jesus Christ came here so that we might be filled with God's grace, the gift we all need that we cannot produce in and of ourselves. But here's the thing about the gift of grace. The gift is there. It was literally sitting across from Nicodemus having a conversation with him. The grace of God is here for each of us. But it calls us to a response. Which brings us to the last part of verse 16 and then ultimately verse 17. See, God in this way loved all of creation, the good and the bad and the ugly, so completely that God, out of God's great love, gave God's unique, one-of-a-kind Son. And if we stopped there, then the sermon would be over. But the verse doesn't stop there. God gave God's one-of-a-kind Son so that whoever believes, pass pistuon. And this brings to us a level of human responsibility. Church, you have a responsibility. The grace is before you. You are called to believe it or not. God, 
acts first. God loves. God gives. God offers and enables humanity to receive and believe in God's gift of grace. And we call Him Jesus. This conversation with Nicodemus reminds us of prevenient grace. It's the grace of God that goes before us, that is at work in our lives and in the work of others before we even know we need grace or we realize we need it and we realize we're in the middle of a situation we cannot fix. Prevenient grace was at work in the hearts of those church members before they even came to me and said, we want to free you up for ministry. God's grace went and did that. I never asked them one single time to do that. God moved them in my direction because God knew we needed it in order to do ministry as God intended. God God knows we need something moving us toward God's grace because we're not going to do it in and of ourselves. And when we realize we need it, we know we can't do it on our own. And God says, here is Jesus, my one-of-a-kind son who's ready to pour this grace out on you. You must believe it. God acts first. Grace always begins with God. But when that grace is offered to us, grace and forgiveness are before us. Our job is to believe, pistuon. And when we say believe, we mean you have that altar moment where you come forth and you say, Jesus, come live in my heart. I'm a sinner. And that's all good and fine. We have good head knowledge. We know who Jesus is. We know all the stories in the Gospels. We even know round about when Jesus was born, when Jesus died. We kind of have an idea what Jesus might have looked like. We know what Jesus said. The words are in it. We have good knowledge of who Jesus is, but pistuon doesn't just mean good head head knowledge. You know what the word means? It means to entrust. Uh, Whoa, whoa, whoa. It means to entrust your life, your words, your deeds, your actions, your relationships, your coming, your going, your financial responsibility. Every single thing in your life means you entrust it to Jesus and to God's kingdom reigning on earth as it does in heaven. It's not just about right belief. We call that orthodoxy. It's about a life change. Proper practice. We call that orthopraxy. You see, when those church members bought our house, we could have just said, thrown our hands up and said, you know what, that's great. We're just going to kick back and we're going to be the lazy pastoral family and we're just going to let God do all the hard work. It produced a life change. We were already sold out, but then in that moment, we decided to double our efforts and really commit ourselves to ministry and bringing God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven and doing so by serving in the local church giving our hearts to our congregation, helping each church we serve be the best church you can be. My goal for Pleasant Hill is for Pleasant Hill to be the best Pleasant Hill that Pleasant Hill can be. You must receive God's grace, but not just believe it in your head. You must live it out in your life because pistuon is not just about knowledge. It is a verb. It is something you do. You do something. You do it differently. You undergo a life change. You obey and live as though your very life and every gift that you had is entrusted to Jesus and God's message given to Jesus, which then leads not to perishing, but to what? Eternal life. That's good news, church. So let's look at this verse once again. That's John 3.16. You ever heard it that way before? Let's look at it this way. This is the grace of Jesus given to us in John 3.16. God loves so completely that God gave God's unique Son so that those who will entrust their lives, actions, words, and deeds to Jesus' God-given message will live into an altered reality and begin eternal life which is changing lives and communities so that God's kingdom reigns on earth as it does in heaven right now, and even upon death will be raised up to live in and enjoy God's perfect kingdom forever. That is grace. This is the gift of 
grace, and it's not just something that you can produce or manufacture, is it, church? You cannot produce this in and of yourself. It is a very specific gift. It is a special gift that only God can provide. And this reminds us that despite our circumstance, grace can find us and grace can make a way. What a gift! Everyone say gift. Say it like you're happy to get it. Gift! I use that word intentionally. You know why? Because the word charis charis, that we translate grace, simply means gift. The beauty of God's gift of grace then in verse 17 is punctuated by some more good news, church. Good news that I think we need to hear a little bit more of. It's punctuated by the fact that Jesus' presence in the world and in our lives is rooted not in vengeance, but in love. Not in vengeance, but in love. You see, Jesus' ultimate desire for the world is that the world through Him might be saved. Only grace, the grace of God through Jesus Christ, can reach down into our mess and make a way for us to be reconciled to God. That is exactly what grace does. What a gift. So as we begin our series on grace, and we begin looking at the grace of God given to us through Jesus as only God can give, number one, I want you to realize that grace is a gift. A gift that comes before us in the person of Jesus Christ and then in the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace is a gift that comes to us when we as a community reach out to one another and realize that somebody is struggling and in the midst of something they cannot help themselves out of and we pray about it and we go to them and we say, God won't let me rest until I have this conversation with you. Whether it's buying a house whether it is helping them with food, whether it is reaching out in some sort of ministry to the community, whether it is coming to a brother or sister and calling them to accountability, saying, I love you dearly, but I see this going awry in your life. Can we have a conversation about it? Is there something we can do to support you as you recover from this? Sometimes that's what grace looks like. It looks like God and God's people reaching out to others who cannot better their situations for themselves. So as you realize that grace is a gift, I ask you, will you recognize your own personal need of this gift today? Will you entrust your life, your words, your deeds, all of your gifts to Jesus so that your life becomes infused with God's grace at every turn? Will you move from death to life? Something that none of us can manufacture and produce on our own, can we? No one in here can cheat death forever. But will you move from death to life? We can't do that, but it requires a special gift. One that's been given to us. The gift of Jesus. God's ultimate and perfect gift. Of grace. Won't you receive His gift today? Won't you live into that grace beginning today? Won't you let the grace of God change you and use you so that your life blesses others today? In the name of the one true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And together the people of God said, Amen. All who are able, please stand. Let's affirm our faith in this grace-giving, grace-gifting God who desires for all of us to live under His grace so that all of creation may be redeemed. At this time as well, if you have kids in Children's Church, if you would go and fetch those young'uns so that Miss Jennifer can head off to her Aunt Jen's house. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God the Father, the Almighty, 
We believe in Jesus Christ, the God's only Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. We believe in the three in one. Amen. As the band plays our closing song, they've chosen a perfect one. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. As they play, if the grace of Jesus is at work in your life, if it is nudging you in some fashion, come and pray. Find out what God is up to in your life. How does God need to use you to bless others? How is God calling you to repentance and to accept the gift of grace so that you are changed completely from the inside out? There is no one in this room or worshiping online that is not experiencing some level of God's grace right this very moment. I call you to accountability. Is God's grace calling you to take your first step in trusting Jesus? That's prevenient grace. God's grace is moving you to accepting Jesus. If you've already accepted Jesus, and God through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit is calling you to something special and great maybe something small something that will change the lives of others I call you to accountability make that change follow Jesus wherever he leads no turning back as the band plays may this altar fill with faithful church members longing to grow in the grace and knowledge and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's unique, one-of-a-kind Son. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back though none go with me still I will follow Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning Rick, would you would you come forward, please? Dwayne, would would you come forward, please? Wayne, would you come forward, please? Would y'all gather around congregation? All who would. 
If you want to come and lay hands on them, you're comfortable doing so, you may. If not, stretch your hand forward to them. I would like to offer a prayer. Uh, Rick's going back for some tests this week. Some numbers have gone the wrong direction. Uh, We're going to continue praying for Janice as she is battling breast cancer. And we're going to continue to pray for Matthew. And Dee Dee is up here. We're going to pray for her friend, Fran, who is in a medically induced coma because of the ill effects of COVID. Let's pray. Creating gracious and healing God. We come before you now as a community, a community of grace, a community of love, a community that loves one another as you love us. And God, quite frankly, when we hear that those among us are struggling, are suffering, are battling cancer in a medically induced coma because of just a vicious, nasty virus, God, that kind of gets our hackles up. My, My first response is one of anger. How dare something like this attack my friends? God, in the midst of whether we're angry or whether we're broken or whether we're just questioning why, in the midst of our anxiety, we ask that you speak your peace amongst your people. Speak your peace, especially among Rick and Dwayne and Janice and Matthew and Cindy and Fran and her family in ways that only you can. And God, we go one step further. If it's selfish, so be it. If I need to be reprimanded in your sight on the day of judgment for asking this in a selfish way, so be it. God, we want healing. Please. As only you can. In your great will. Provide healing. Give these medical professionals knowledge beyond what even med school can offer. Fill them with something they've never been filled with before so that these persons who weigh so heavily on our heart can stand up and walk out of hospital beds and hospital rooms and cancer treatment centers and ring bells and do whatever to stand before everyone that knows them and declare your glory. God, we ask for healing, your presence, your peace, your grace, and above all, your love to flow abundantly through these, our brothers and sisters, whom we love so dearly. And we do it knowing that we love them this much and you love them all the more. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And together, God's people said, Amen.